Hello again and welcome. In this video I'm primarily going to be talking about the 121 GW but before we get started I thought I'd mention this T6 one more time that Fluke put out. I had somebody post on one of my videos where they were basically saying if you hook this thing up to something other than the ground, earth ground, and you try to use this non-contact input that the meter wouldn't work. So basically this couldn't be used for a phase-to-phase -phase measurement. So I took this thing into the field with me again and I tried some phase-to-phase -phase measurements using the non-contact sensor, basically attaching our common lead here to one of the other phases, and it seemed to work just fine with that. However, the one thing I did notice that day is I did try it with another motor controller. This one happened to be a Mitsubishi controller, and it was connected up to a motor, and sure enough, this meter wouldn't work with that controller, and basically I tried everything I could as far as touching the button or using the separate comm lead, and the meter would not work. It was detecting the ground circuit, but it would not display any voltage. So we looked at the carrier frequency for that controller, and I think it was programmed somewhere around 5 kilohertz. I had ran this meter previously with a motor controller, and it worked just fine, but those motor controllers were running, you know, in excess of 10 kilohertz. So we turned that controller all the way up to, I think, 14 or 15 kilohertz, and this thing started working just fine. We then tried, I think it was like maybe 8 kilohertz, and that didn't work as well. So if you're going to use this with a variable frequency drive, I think it's going to be hit and miss whether or not you'll be able to use this non-contact detector or not. It definitely seems to be frequency dependent. So recently there's been some post up on the EV blog where there was a person that had joined the Kickstarter, they had received their meter, and they've damaged it. I believe they're probably the first one that's actually damaged their meter outside of the problems that everybody else is having with the switch. So they show some pictures of the damaged area. So Dave's been working with this person to try to identify what actually happened. In one of Dave's posts, he says the energy to do that couldn't have come from the V-Jack. There's at least a PTC and a 1K in series with every path. Even if the contacts shorted in the VA range contacts and in the ohms contacts, worst case path would be the V to ground via the PTC plus the 1K. This is looking at the latest schematic for the 121GW. And this is our volt ohm input. This is one of the PTCs that Dave's mentioning. And that's in series with a 1K ohm resistor. And then we have two mobs in series going back to the ground or the common input. And these are the two contacts in question that were actually burned. This other side of the switch goes down to this point here, which is here, which has another 100 ohm resistor into some diode clamps back to VSS. And eventually this works its way back to the analog ground. So the point that Dave's making is that even if you had some high voltage input here, that's going to be limited by the resistance of these two devices. Now the PTC's resistance is obviously going to change with current. Eventually this part would build some heat and the resistance would go up and that's going to limit the amount of current. But as long as this part is cold, it's basically going to be a 1.2K ohm resistor. So if you caught my early videos when David provided me with this pre-production 121GW, you know that I damaged this thing a few times. I've rebuilt it and I actually was able to go in and harden the meter. So this thing right now is 100% functional. So the problem that I found with this meter, or the weak link, is actually this IC right here. This is a HEF 4053. I believe that the absolute maximum rating for this from VDD to VSS was 18 volts or something. I ended up having to swap this out for a CMOS part and that gave me I think two more volts of margin. So with that changed out I was able to come up with a clamp that would actually protect this device you know, against the transients I could put out with this smaller generator. Again originally I believe that this meter failed at 2000 volts. So looking at that damaged area of the rotary switch one of the things that I had posted was even this particular transient generator would not put out enough energy to cause that kind of damage. Again, this is not a DC supply. It puts out an exponential waveform, and again, it can go as high as about 6,000 volts, and it has roughly a 100 microsecond full width half height. I think for it to burn the circuit board the way that it happened, it would have actually have had to have been something like a DC source something that's going to sustain that current for a fair amount of time. So if we had a thousand volts and we divided that by our 2300 ohm resistor 
Again, that's our 1K ohm resistor in series with a, say, 1.3K ohm PTC. That gives us 435 milliamps. That's a fair amount of current at that high a voltage. you got to believe that that could cause some damage. So what I have here, this is an ohmite part. And we can see that this one is rated for 2,500 ohms. So I have a high voltage power supply that's attached to these two clips here. And this is our positive and our ground. And you can see I've got four wires going to these. Two of the wires here are going back to our attenuator. And then that's attached to our Bryman meter. So this is looking at the voltage rated right to alligator clips. So what I'm going to do is we'll attach our ground lead to our resistor. We'll just put this in our vise. I'm going to just hook up a piece of wire. Set that across a block of wood. And what I'll do is I'll just short these two together. And let's just see what happens. Again, most GFIs will trip at roughly... I think 8 milliamps or something. Here we're playing with, you know, a thousand volts, and we're going to put in enough current that last time I applied with this power supply, we took out the fuse in the Bryman meter. Again, this is rated over 400 milliamps. So this is not the kind of thing you want to play around with. So let's just go ahead and we'll start turning up the voltage. So currently this is putting out 10 volts. And you can see not a lot going on. This will be with basically 100 volts. And you can see it doesn't even spark. Let's go ahead and turn this up even higher. It's 260 volts. And again can see it doesn't even spark. Let's go up even higher. Oh, we're just starting to see a spark now. So this is at 420 volts. You can see I can't get the gap very far apart and it'll blow right out. Let's just turn it up so there's a thousand volts. Again, a fair amount of current there. Again, this is not something you want to be touching with your bare hands. <laughs> so this is the last Harbor Freight meter that we ran. Again, this is the same meter that I put through all the life cycle testing. It's also the same meter that I eventually damaged with my new ESD gun. And the last time I played with it, I hooked it up to this same power supply. And I put it into the resistance mode. And I applied a thousand volts DC to it. And of course that damaged the meter where it will no longer power up. It's done quite a bit of damage to it. You can see a fair amount of burn marks through it. So, let's just take the circuit board out. You can see the switch contacts themselves look pretty good. So I think what might have happened in this case is if the meter had a high voltage power supply across those two inputs and it was in the ohms range where the clamp was active, of course then you don't have very much voltage across the two inputs. But now as that contact moves away, we can draw an arc. So this is my Fluke 87V prototype. So I've got my couple of mobs here in series. I've got my clamps over here. Of course, now I've removed the straps for these. So none of the high-speed clamps are engaged. Here's the 1K ohm resistor. And again, this is like a 1.3K ohm PTC. Here's a stickler for details. We can go ahead and measure that. And you can see it's about 2.2K ohms. So one wire of that is going up to this switch contact here. See that works its way around the circuit board. Then I have our return path attached to this trace here. So this area right across here is what we're going to try to arc across. So 
Got these laying on a piece of Pyropel. Again, that's basically a high temperature insulation. I've got this little probe here. This is attached to the side of our PTC as well. This is going to act as our rotating contact. So what I'm going to do is start with a wire on the ground lead and I'll strike it across to the high lead. And let's just see if this causes some kind of similar damage. That's assuming that the circuit board can even take a thousand volts across it, which I'm not really sure. So there's roughly 50 volts. I think what I'm going to do is change our camera pointing down at this. All right, should give you a pretty good view. So again, this is roughly 56 volts. And you can see nothing's happening. So let's go ahead and turn it up. It's roughly 300 volts. See the switch is not breaking down. It's 500. Six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred, nine hundred, thousand volts. So that fluke interface right now has a thousand volts across it. Again, we'll just take this little probe here and let's try to strike an arc. There you go. Let me just disconnect all this real quick. <laughs> Again, you start playing around with milliamps at thousands of volts. That's not something you want to just be grabbing onto with your hands. Alright, so even with the PTC and the 1K ohm resistor, at a voltage that's lower than what these mobs are going to clamp at, you can see the damage that we've caused. Again, very similar. We'll just take a little bit of alcohol and let's wipe this off real quick. And you can see we have burned right through that circuit board. So again, if you have a thousand volt source, this input protection is only going to limit that to a few hundred milliamps. And that couple hundred milliamps is certainly enough energy to do a substantial amount of damage to the circuit board itself. I think that's going to be it for this video. Hope you enjoyed it. Till the next video. Later on.